Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation. My name is John. I am the Tattooed Historian. It's great to be joined this evening by my friend, Dr. Niels Eichhorn. He, is, he got his PhD from the University of Arkansas in 2013. He's currently at Middle Georgia State University. And he's also the chief editor of H Civil War. Niels, how are you this evening? I'm good. Thanks for having me, John. Oh, this is awesome. I'm, I'm really glad that you you came on and on a Friday evening. So hopefully this is great Friday evening entertainment for everyone. I hope so. Everyone got to be ready to have some fun tonight. <laughs> yes, we will. We will try to fill up the comments. <laughs> yes, indeed. We'll try to fill up the comment section with questions and comments and, and all that good stuff. Uh, but, yeah. But Niels, I want to start out from your beginning as far as where did this whole journey begin for you in the history field? Where did it start? It started a lot later than you probably expect because we're not going to go to age. <laughs> yeah. uh, it was in the late 1990s in Germany where they showed Gettysburg, the movie. And I remember it vividly because it was May 1st, Thursday. And the next Friday, I had to go to class. And as a result, I was not allowed to stay up until midnight. <laughs> and the tape recorder gave out, like, just as Pickett's charges taking oh. off. <laughs> and oh. at that point, I kind of was like, OK, what? how did this go? What happened? And I, it was an extremely difficult time finding books in Germany on the Civil War. I mean, you kind of got these little. 200 pages uh, talked about like the Civil War in like five pages. Um, you, the only one I could find was Battle Cry of Freedom in translation. That was the only book that was available. And I kind of got into it. We started traveling to the US shortly after and I picked up books there. And that's somewhat how my interest in, at that stage, the military side of the Civil War began. At that stage, I kind of was like, well, I would like to do this eventually, maybe for an undergrad. <clears throat> mm -hmm. and I wasn't quite sure yet if I wanted to pursue this professionally as kind of a historian or not. And I got lucky with my second semester at Terry Beckenbaugh for an upper level Civil War history course. And it was great because he was like, write a research paper. All right, what is a good research paper topic? <laughs> right, I was a freshman, I was like, I don't know anything yet. I didn't hadn't even had US one as a history class and I hadn't had it in school for sure either. Mm -hmm. So he kind of was like, what about Germany during the Civil War? I was mm -hmm. like, hmm, that's okay. a good question. So I went to the Magnet libraries. They had a f very few little items. Like I looked through some of the Civil War magazines and, but in the great scheme of things was like, there's nothing really written. And that sort of was the moment where I was like, maybe that's the dissertation I should write. Um, mm -hmm. That all changed a little bit in the course of the next few years with like the diplomacy side that I got interested in, then the transnational side I got interested in, visuals I got interested in, like the pictures that you use for promotion purposes. Mm -hmm. The uh, I think it's the guy standing next to Seward there on the edge of the picture. Yeah. That... Rudolf Schleiden was sort of one of the people that I really got interested in because in part he was from an area where I grew up. He was born like not far from where I was born. And he the part that really struck me was he was in Richmond in April of 1861 to talk with Alexander Stevens. So war has started. Mm -hmm. Schleiden is in Richmond, had talked with Seward and Lincoln and tries to negotiate some form of truce to prevent the war. And it's sort of like, in part, I kind of was like, why don't we talk about this? Mm -hmm. But the part that even more interested me was sort of like, what's the thought process that Schleiden is going through? Because he was a revolutionary. He was on Stevens's side in 1848, but now he's on the other side <laughs> or mm -hmm. in no, no side really. And it's sort of like, What's going through his mind? Why is he doing this? What's what's the role here? And that really kind of started me then on kind of the project that became the dissertation is part of liberty and slavery, where I kind of was like, why? 
what what is this man carrying as ideological intellectual baggage with him to the americas that makes him willing to risk i mean a lot his career potentially in an effort to prevent the american civil war mm. yeah that's a lot of people don't realize that that they brought ideas with them from other places to influence what they thought here in the united states during the american civil war which you go into great detail in your book and and thank you for that 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 liberty and slavery lsu press i've put a pinned remark in your in your description over here ladies and gentlemen so you can get right to lsu press pick up your copy of liberty and slavery there i really enjoyed this book niels uh because of the fact that uh i'm going to be going into a program where i'm going to be a transnational fix on my you know, dissertation and uh I really li like how we draw in things that we bring with us, so to speak, when we go to a new place, and they were no different then. And you know, the, the big part that I really was, why I wrote the books the way it is written was, well, it was about a third is devoted to European kind of backgrounds, was that I looked at these 48 or studies, I looked at, you got these biographies on, Patrick Claiborne and Thomas Mayer and these other Irishmen. And it's like, it's almost sometimes feels like they're getting off the boat and it's like, hey, here I am, what's up? And <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. But, 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 but what are they bringing with them? Why, why are they here? What did they do mm -hmm. in Europe? And it's sort of this overlooked aspect, which then leads to sometimes these misconceptions about these groups, right? It's like, mm -hmm. oh, Aussie. German Americans are, of course, liberty embracing anti slavery advocates. And it's not that simple. Mm -hmm. And and even the uh, what's going on here in the States in the 1830s and 40s and how yes. that impacts uh, secession, separatists, nullification, that yeah. kind of things, which I found fascinating was uh, in your in your book, you talk about the 1830s nullification crisis. And, mm -hmm with South Carolina. And, uh, and of course it wasn't a hundred percent for nullification, but they, they decide to go with it. And I think that's fascinating because we forget about the antebellum nullification crises in the popular history sphere. Yes. You know, like all of a sudden it came to secession and that was it. And everyone was on board and in actuality it had been going on for years. Correct. Yeah, it is. And I think that's the interesting kind of part to consider there is that, in, in part, it is this kind of continuation that you see. And I recently taught the American Civil War actually as a class. And I actually started with Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, even because I kind of was like, where does secession kind of intellectually originate in the United States, leaving the Declaration of Independence, which is a secession document aside. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, here you have the Kentucky and Virginia resolution. Then privately, the two men are talking about hey, maybe we should, as a last resort, potentially use secession if the U.S. is kind of trying to come after our rights in that kind of a fashion, kind of eliminate the First Amendment. And that sort of becomes the linchpin when you really think about secession in the U.S., this kind of Southern identity builder. It's like we are a separate entity in the country. We are different from the rest of the country. And obviously most of that is because of slavery and the plantation south. But it's sort of like we, we're developing this notion that how the country is constructed, we're building it on the history that we believe the American Revolution was fought over. We're, we're building it on a certain intellectual base, ethnic base, potentially even. Um, it, it's elite, it's elite base. It's coming down from the top to the lowest ranks of society. Some buy into it, some don't, but that's sort of, the development in 1830, it doesn't work. South Carolina stands isolated. You get to 1850, there's more support. I mean, you got the National Convention taking place, but we're still not quite there. There's still not enough support, and the fire just haven't quite yet developed yet enough power in the southern states to really say, okay, we're going to do this. Mm -hmm. And then we get to 1860 and you get to the point where it's like, okay, A, we're going to, we learn from our past mistakes. We're going to really manipulate it and we're going to push it now and we're going to make this a success. Mm -hmm. So it, 
it's it's sort of building blocks that you start to develop. But I think that's also kind of by the 1860s, you really have that stronger Southern identity available where people are like, yes, I understand what it means to be Southern versus being part of the United States. Mm -hmm. How about the hierarchical things that are going on, uh, especially when, when you spoke about Virginia and uh, Virginia elite compared to Western Virginians uh, at that time? It's It's... I didn't realize it that uh, we were starting to see that rift so far back in the 1830s with uh, Virginia Tidewater planters looking down upon their Appalachian brother Virginians. Yeah, and I, I, in large part, what I kind of was curious about and sort of was my my search at the time that I kind of was like, how how are these individuals who are not included fairly in the political process, how are they perceiving of that? Because in Europe, as we'll probably go into a little bit more in, later on, mm -hmm. when you look at the Hungarians or the Poles, they oftentimes talk in terminology of slavery that because they're lacking political rights, economic freedom, national freedom, they're an enslaved people. Well, in the US, that's a little bit more complicated. Of course, we have a institution of slavery that takes from African-American rights away. So. You can't really say we are slaves when there are people working on the plantation next door who are slaves. Mm -hmm. And so there was a little bit more of a workaround that they had to come up with to kind of talk about it. But it's very much a class difference. There's that perception that the planter and the small farmer don't have a lot in common, that this rich planter, because they created the state their ancestors created the state way back when, created a political system that hasn't changed in decades. They hold all this political power, and we, a large group in the West, we're not being given a fair share. Mm -hmm. We're not getting a fair number of seats in the state legislature. So aren't we similarly enslaved, as one of them actually says? by these planters, not in the same fashion that the slaveholder is enslaving his chattel, but in a political sense. Mm -hmm. And you, I think in large part it is because Virginia is such an old state that you do have this kind of willingness to kind of talk about it. The, the planters hold on power is not as strong in Virginia as it is in, say, South Carolina. You wouldn't see this in South Carolina. There's just... I mean, the, the hold that the planet aristocracy has is just so strong in there. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Is it almost like a maybe they they aren't slaves in that word here in America, but may, is it kind of like a parallel with European serfdom, possibly instead of slave? Uh, <laughs> or is that a completely different ball game altogether? <laughs> no, no, I think you, you you you're having a good point there because in large part that's something we have to consider, and that was sort of the linguistic. Uh, juggling acts that I had to go through a little bit with, in particular, the um, the German side. Because, I mean, when you think about it, the, the serf or the Slav, of course, Slavs were oftentimes serfs, and that's where we get the terminology of slavery in part from. It's, it's these Eastern Europeans who are being oppressed people. So serfdom, per se, isn't quite slavery because you do have some rights within it. You're not, you're bound to a land, you're bound to a Lord, but the Lord, Lord can mistreat you like the planter or s the planter does. <clears throat> mm. Yet the perception that a slave or serve can be the same does exist um that's where i kind of with schleswig holstein had to go into this like there, there's not the use in schleswig holstein among some of these early nationalists in 1830 to say we are enslaved what they're they're using is that they are um in knechtschaft which is a it's it's serfdom mm -hmm. but you could easily translate that into slave mm -hmm. as Okay, so it is, it is balancing it is, after the German language. <laughs> yeah, I I did terrible <laughs> in, that, in that language. I, I took it for three years, and I'm, I'm still terrible 
at, at that. I was made for the more for the romance languages. I'm sorry. Well, I, <laughs> I struggle yeah. every time my dad calls too, but I'm kind of oh, like, yeah. hey, I'll have to really up my game here soon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with with nullification crises in the United States in the 1830s, we move into the 1840s and we start to see a lot of revolutionary ideals and separatist ideals in Europe. Uh, most notably, and many Americans uh, and, and Canadians will understand that a lot of it is uh, a lot of us are used to hearing about the Irish, and yes. we, we tend to forget about other areas of Europe who, who are indeed doing roughly the same thing and for longer periods of time because i think ireland only lasted what six six days <laughs> something like yeah, that see, so, yeah, i see no it's like 21 days but, yeah. but at the same time when you sing of ireland as most people do mm -hmm. most people sing of ireland with the potato famine right the a revolution is sort of like oh there was something <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in parts that is a general problem that we we think of the economic refugees and we overlook the non-economic refugees that come out of Ireland. But that's the groups that eventually takes on these political leadership positions. Mm -hmm. Individuals like Mayor of the Irish Brigade, he's not an economic refugee. He's a prisoner who escaped British custody and comes to the United States because of what he did in 1848 in Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's in part what you have is that this has been long building. I mean, that's sort of why the 1830 chapter was very difficult to write because very little happened in some of these places because either the individuals are fairly young or the national ideals and understandings haven't quite developed yet in these various regions, but it's really in 48 where it takes off. And I'm, as a historian, I'm very reluctant to kind of make this, and also as a German, very reluctant to say that it all starts in France. Well, because it doesn't really all start in France. <laughs> but what you have is that you have, for example, in 1846, you have instances in Poland where you already start rumblings. And 47, late 47, you see in the South German states rumblings. And that's teaching 1848 is probably one of the most difficult things ever to do and writing about it because it just, it's so multifaceted. You have some political desires, which in part you see with the Irish where they want the Irish parliament um, returned to them, which had been abolished by the Act of Union in 1800, 1801. Um, you look at Hungary, they want to have their own say in domestic affairs. They're not, not initially rebelling against Austrian Habsburg rule, but they are wanting some form of autonomy was in their part of the empire. Um, then you have the national side, this kind of desire for Italian or German unification at the same time that the Hungarians start to talk about, well, we're a separate entity, so we want to be distant and different from those Germans in Austria. Um, the Irish say we are a different people and therefore we don't want to be ruled from London. We want to have our own parliament. Hmm. There's, there's social economic aspects that class place into I mean it's I always caution my students when I'm like well don't think because Marx publishes that manifesto at this moment that it has a huge impact it, it's way too early to have it but there is class conflict there is demands from workers there's demands from peasants there's going back to your earlier question we still have serfdom in parts of Eastern Europe which will finally get abolished by this stage um, I mean, France in the summer of 48 is completely engulfed in Paris in particular by social revolutions where people are like, we, we don't want to leave the city or join the army. Just, there's no jobs here. The state should take care of us in some form. Mm -hmm. um, so in that regard, it's, it's an incredibly volatile period. And... The Irish, I think, are a great example in that because it's this difficulty of how do you how do you manage this? In part, you don't want to be as closely aligned with France. You would like French aid, just like you had with Wolf Tom in seventeen in the seventeen nineties. Mm -hmm. But if you do, the British may use that to crack down more heavily on you. Mm -hmm. You look to Europe, you look to Belgium, you look to Poland. What happens if you're not an independent country? 
and how you're going to get pushed around and you're being oppressed as a people. But then you also realize the religious differences. Um, a lot of the leading figures of the um, Irish Confederation are Protestant and Catholic. Mm -hmm. Daniel O'Connell, who is the leader of the 1830 um, emancipation of the Irish Catholics, so that Catholics can actually sit in, in Parliament again and hold office, he wanted a strictly Catholic run movement for autonomy. So you have this kind of religious conflict that is taking hold. And then the economic crisis. People are dying by the, mil by the million in Ireland. And the British government seems to be doing nothing. Mm -hmm. So it's this combination of a lot of these factors that leads to the Irish to rebel. And at that point, it is they're basically doing it because they have the choice to get arrested or rebel. Um, the British ended the writ of habeas corpus, passed these, the Irish called the Treason Felony Act, which basically allowed the British government to arrest you on the suspicion that you wanted to do something. Um, mm -hmm. They didn't need any evidence, they just perceived that you were a threat and you were going to get incarcerated. And at that stage, the, Irish, the leaders in the Irish Confederation knew, game's up. Well, we get arrested or we start a rebellion and they started a rebellion. <laughs> but, so it was just, I think in the book I call it the least prepared and least well-developed one of the 1848 uprisings. Mm -hmm. um, it lasts, like on the ground, there are some that it takes a little time to arrest, but it takes lasts about six days. And uh, I had the chance one year to actually see where's the only real I don't even want to call it a military engagement. It's more like a skirmish takes place. The What today is a famine war house. It was the widow McCormick's house at the time. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> like you drive there today, you're kind of like, where am I headed? Because you're driving down like two field alleys to get to it. Wow. <laughs> Unpaved roads. Mm -hmm. And but that's sort of this moment where you're like, yeah, I can see why this didn't have any success. If you don't have Dublin behind you, well, there's just not enough population to bring to bear. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that is separate, and I, I will say that in 48, from other movements at that time, because you look at the other examples I bring up in 48, which let's be Holstein and Hungary, mm -hmm. Ireland didn't have a foreign intervention. They, did, they tried to get the French involved, but they failed in that. But you look at Schleswig-Holstein, because of its location, it is a international affair. Weakening Denmark could change the entire balance of power in Northern Europe. Russia can't allow that, Britain can't allow that, Sweden can't allow it. And all of a sudden you have this massive international interest that eventually says, no, 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 you're done. <laughs> We, we hear what you want, but right. we're not tolerating this. Um, hmm. in, and the Hungarian movement, there are some historians that say it's the Russians that really are f instrumental in putting it down, but there's also evidence that the Austrians would have done it eventually themselves too. So it's, but you do have a foreign intervention there. Hmm. It, it's almost like we uh, we in America think that everything happened in a vacuum. In many cases, it was a uh, you know this was a, a a weird world occurrence for 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 us to be doing this. When actually, when you look around, there's there's small revolutions and separatist movements and secession movements going on uh, almost since 1781, 1783. You start to see it's almost a lineage. <laughs> of, yeah. of revolution yeah and i think that's something I, I i only look at four european examples i mean i i i contemplated bringing in sicily because sicily is a great example from southern europe for the, the purpose of what i was doing with the book but in part language barrier was just and i kind of was like do i really need another one especially if i would have to learn italian for this and go to Italy potentially to do research. Right. Um, but you look at South America, it's like before even New Granada, before Bolivar and anything, you have like Cartagena that is debating breaking away. I mean, this is sort of like before we get to Texas, 
we have events in South America where these states are not quite formed. And I think that's the same that you have throughout the entirety of the early 19th century in Europe, a Europe, South America, North America, that unfortunately we don't have a good nation state identity yet. And that applies in the US too. I mean, we, we're talking about Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address, I Pete, <laughs> with regard to um, this being the second birth of the country, because mm -hmm. it's before the United States was this potentially group of independent states, have, have some sovereignty, but afterwards it's defined as a nation state. And the same you can look at with regard to Europe, that the Irish are, they are an independent entity that they want to re have returned to them, Hungarians. So there's, there's all of this conflict and some of it, and this goes sort of where you're headed in the future, some of it is not gonna get solved until uh, the, the First World War. Mm -hmm. or it doesn't get solved until the Second World War. Right. Um, but for my purposes, in part why I stopped in the Civil War, because I, I look at the Civil War as kind of this last major secession movement that is actually on a large scale defeat. Um, mm -hmm. And yes, I study defeat <laughs> because that's how these movements all are, right? right? But at the same time, after the Civil War, when you look at the United States, we're not getting another secession movement in the Southern states. And all the conflicts that we have afterwards are class-based, working class conflicts. Um, the great strikes that you have in 77, Pullman, um, Haymarket, the same happens in Europe. It's the class identities that takes off in Great Britain, Germany, and France. And it's the it's commune in 1871 that shatters everything we know. In my other book, Atlantic World uh, in the 19th century, actually makes a claim that we may have to look at the Paris Commune in the same fashion that we look at the uprising in Saint Domain in, eight, in the 1790s. Mm -hmm. After 1790, after 1804, wherever you want to go, all planter societies look at Saint Domain and like, that's why we can't emancipate. In the same fashion, everyone looks at the Paris Commune after 1871 and says, uh, working class strikes are really bad. Mm. So it's, and that's where I think there's some changes coming after the Civil War where identity shifts. We, we kind of figured out we're German, we're Irish, we're British. But now comes the challenge of, well, but we're working class British or working class mm -hmm. Irish, which sets us apart from others. Mm -hmm. Previous to that class conflict uh, coming about in, in the 1840s, 1850s and such, is this all remnants and leftover of uh, the Napoleonic conflicts and, and conquer, conquering lands and people trying to find a sense of an identity and mingling and all that stuff? Is that kind of a, because after the fall of Rome, we see the same thing. And I'm wondering if it's because of, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to blame Napoleon here. <laughs> well, I, I'll go with you. I, I, oh, yeah. We can blame Napoleon for anything. Oh, yeah. It's always great. But yeah. <laughs> I'm always a little cautious because we do have two of them. After all, we've got Napoleon one and we've got Napoleon That's three. True. <laughs> it's true. Napoleon the third came up with my favorite artillery piece. So I don't mind him, but uh, I'm talking, I'm talking the, the big enchilada. I'm yes. The first one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think in, in large part, especially if you look at Europe, you look at South America, why do you have all the Spanish American independence movements? Why do you have Greek independence in eighteen in the 1820s? Mm -hmm. It's because the French revolutionary armies in the, <laughs> the irony, in the process of their conquest, bring with them nationalism as a notion. And it's like, oh wait, the French <laughs> conquered us, but we are different from the French, so we should rebel because we're German, we're Austrian, we're Italian. Why right. would we want to get ruled by the French? And and right. that's sort of like, that's a difficulty after 1815. These notions of a constitutional government, a uh, limited monarchy or constitutional monarchy, the notion that there is sort of a nationality or a nation, whether that is civic based or ethnic based or soil based, whichever one you want to go with. Mm -hmm. The French brought it to people 
And that stuff you just can't eradicate out of people's minds. And the result is it starts to grow. It starts to in increase in number. People buy into it throughout Europe, into the Americas. I mean, that's just sort of for potentially students watching, the 19th century Atlantic world is an incredibly connected area. I mean, yeah, it takes a month to get a letter across, but people knew about things happening in other parts of the world. I mean, it's fascinating looking through some of these Southern newspapers and they're covering stuff in like Chile and like a small revolution that some history books don't even talk about. And you're like, why? Yeah. Yeah, it's just an enormous interest people had in the world. I, and I think it was a world. I think that's something we also don't we we take it for granted uh, that we think that other events happen in a vacuum too. I mm. mean, they, they definitely knew, like you say, they definitely knew in South Carolina or New York or wherever it may be that something was going on, you know, in 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 Ireland or something was going on in 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 Poland. And, and so it may have taken place two months ago, but they they found out. Right, and that's why you have this, I mean, it, it's very limited in the book, but it's sort of like, um, you look at Kossuth, the leader of the Hungarian uprising, he, he eventually, I mean, he, he there's a dual biography for him and Jefferson Davis that needs to be written at some point. Um, they both are these, incredible micromanagers constantly mangles themselves into military affairs and those are serving a lost cause effectively not pun intended for the lost cause of the confederacy right. in the 19th century right. there <laughs> this defeated cause um but he eventually flees the country and everyone knows that if he is not in some form finding himself protection the austrians are going to assassinate him. that's just how mm -hmm. it's going to go um because they're trying to extradite him, but the extradition treaty only allows for, I think, bandits to be extradited. He's not a bandit, he's a revolutionary. So it's sort of like, right. it doesn't fit. Um, so the US offers him asylum. And you have a couple hundred Hungarians that come on a um, US warship over to the United States. Um, the US minister in to the papal states, I forget his name now. He offered Garibaldi the same thing, that we'll, we'll offer you asylum, you can come on board a warship and we'll ship you and your man over to the United States. Um, so the US was very much interested in what was happening. And the, the funny part that I kind of had to deal with in the research of the book was that I had three individuals <laughs> who all supposedly got the largest and biggest welcome that the United States ever granted somebody in the 19th century in New York. Mm -hmm. One of them was Casus, who when he came to the US finally, and uh, in class I always like jokingly, I'm like, yeah, you basically have to imagine like people have bumper stickers, cups, hats, t-shirts, <laughs> Like everything, everything you can imagine of Kossuth because it's just this Kossuth fever that goes through the country. People are like, this big damn revolutionary is coming to the US on a speaking tour. I mean, he's here because he wants to get money for another uprising, but it's sort of like, it's 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 a celebrity of the century coming to the country. Mm -hmm. um, the other one, the next one that, I'm mixing my chronology up here a little bit. The next one to arrive is Thomas Mayer. Having escaped from Tasmania, Vendiem's land, the devil's land, and having kind of made his way to the United States finally, arrives in New York, and again, massive crowds are supposedly lining the harbor. And the last one is John Mitchell. Now, he comes by a circuitous route because he does escape, his escape plans don't quite work out, and he eventually ends up in San Francisco initially, but San Francisco no offense to people from San Francisco, is perceived by him in 1850 as doll. Mm -hmm. So the guy decides, oh, well, I'll, I'll go to New York. And again, massive numbers of people that welcome the man. So it's like, this is not just the Irish community, because there's no Hungarian community in the United States. We're talking a couple hundred 
Hungarians that have migrated to the United States over the years. It's, it's not a big group. Mm -hmm. So it's just in part these individuals, because of the newspaper coverage, they're celebrities. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I don't know, big movie star showing up in your small town. And you're like, yeah, everyone is going to be out. Mm -hmm. And you're going to listen to everything they have to say. Yeah. And then that's going to it. And that, yeah, and that's going to frame your idea of world events by yeah. that yeah. interaction with that one person. And that's what a lot of these people initially make money with. They, they go on speaking tours, Mayor, Mitchell, I mean, Casus. They all go and speak, and that's how they make initially money. And with some of them, it makes sense because it's like you look at especially the Hungarians, and it's like they were in the military. That's the only profession that they had, so it's sort of like, the U.S. doesn't need me as a warrior because the U.S. isn't fighting a major war right now. So what am I supposed to do? Oh, maybe I should just engage in some form of speaking and game, speaking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With all these <clears throat> separatist movements going on in the antebellum period, 1840s, 1850s, uh, how, how does the Confederacy fit into these separatist movements uh, with the secession crisis in the early days of the war? Well, in a comparative perspective, it is extremely similar to anything that you had previous. Um, so it's, if you want, you could look at Poland in 1830 as a blueprint or um, Greece in the 1820s as a blueprint that everyone goes with. Um, that when it comes down to it, it's this kind of lines that we're going to have these grievances that build up over time. And these grievances need to reach a certain point at which we feel that we can't find a way to, that we can't find a remedy anymore. That the state that we're in is not going to accept us, that the state is oppressing us, is limiting our rights. Now, there is a slight difference with regard to the South in that the Southern secession is preemptive because it is, after all, the assumption in Mississippi's secession declaration is great in that regard of what Lincoln will do rather than what Lincoln has done mm -hmm. that brings about the secession. That said, that is something where the other Europe where a lot of Europeans will look at it and say, no, that's why you're not as legitimate as we were. Because we rebelled, because you, as our mother state, took some action that dramatically infringed on our rights. Um, for example, in the case of Hungary, that kind of would be where the Hungarian, where the Austrian government puts Banjalajic, who is a Croatian, and Croatia is part of the Hungarian side of the empire, in charge of the state. He becomes banned by Austrian decree. And the Hungarians say, no, you can't do that. That's our state. We can do that, but not you in BM. So at that stage, escalation in part takes place. Um, when you look at Schleswig-Holstein, it is when the Danish king says, I'm going to integrate Schleswig, which is part Danish, part German. That's when the Germans say, okay, we're done. You want to rip this country, the, these two statues apart. You're violating an international treaty. We're leaving. We're going to rebel. So in, in these European cases, there is more of a clear offense that they perceive happened and again, that's why they look at the South as you're not quite legitimate because you are preemptively doing something instead of waiting for the constitutional violation to take place, at which point you legitimately could do this. Hmm. That said, of course, most of these Southern states will look to these European instances and say, well, we're doing what the Italians did. We're doing what the Hungarians did. We're doing what the Irish did. Mm -hmm. so they, they very much are perceiving themselves in as the next example. I mean, it's sort of like exhibit A, exhibit B, exhibit C. Uh, the South is sort of down in the alphabet, probably at G or H. Right. <laughs> considering right. the number of events that had taken place. 
that goes to a, a question that uh, Neil Skudra, uh, I hope I said your name right, Neil, uh, posted earlier. Uh, do you feel like Confederate leaders were inconsistent in framing their war for Southern independence as emblematic of independence movements across the world? Uh, they did not voice support for nationalists in Ireland and Mexico since they sought recognition for Britain and France. It's a great question. That is perfectly right into what we're talking about now. Um, in, in part, yes and no. Um, and I had a conversation recently with Ann Tucker about this too, who is about to publish a book on the U.S. kind of perspective of using, or the Southerners using European examples and newspapers to kind of um, create a legitimacy for themselves. And in part, Southerners will use whatever fits their interest. Um, so if that means, it, this is sort of like the running gags that Ann and I have, that if you look at Italy, and Southerners loved Italy because Italy is under the shoe of the Austrians, it is being oppressed by the Austrians, and it needs its freedom from the Austrians. Yet by 1860, the only Italian province that is still under Austrian rule is Venetia in the north eastern corner. When you look at Italy, what it's actually doing, it's unification. It is exactly what Lincoln is saying. It's in, what he is intending to do to the, for, to the United States. He wants to bring the Italian states, uh, the U.S. states back together, which is what Cavour is intending to do in Italy. Um, but Southerners will then turn it around and say, well, but... What the Italians are doing is what we are doing because we're trying to bring the, the southern states together into a union. Um, so a lot of it is about how do you frame yourself in the right way. Um, now, Mexico and France are a great example, too, because and this sort of goes into my diplomatic side of work, because France, especially with Napoleon III, is such an unpredictable and crazy place yeah. but at the same time once you kind of figure out that you just have to accept a certain craziness from the man it becomes logical <laughs> <laughs> um now when you look at the u.s or the confederate states or rebellious states i should say um would they want napoleon supported maximiliano on the throne in mexico with an empire likely in the long term no Mm -hmm. because they still have ambitions into the Caribbean and a powerful Mexico is not going to be a good neighbor long term. But in the short term, to get France involved in the war in some form, they all accept it. If Maximilian is going to recognize the Confederacy, if Napoleon is going to help the Confederacy in some form, temporarily, it's going to be accepted. Um, and that's what a lot of commentators in the Civil War era were wondering about why did why is Great Britain and France so perceived at least they're not really but perceived at least friendly to the court's Confederacy because look at the filibusters in the 1850s it was Southerners who tried to destabilize the entire Caribbean basin mm -hmm. so why would anyone want to be in, involved with that mm -hmm. so it's Southerners play, they're not very good at it, but they're trying to play the international game. And sometimes that means accepting something that you really wouldn't want to have happen, i.e. Mexico and France in some form of close relationship. But if that means winning the war, mm -hmm. unfortunately you do it. So lesser of two evils. Yeah. Yeah, basically. And you can live with it for a time until maybe that relationship wears off. Yeah. And I mean, that's what a lot of revolutionaries have to eventually make as a decision. Lesser of two evils. Am I going to accept defeat? Or I'm going to keep fighting and losing. Mm -hmm. But if I accept defeat now, maybe in two years I can try again. Right. Recover and start over. I mean, that's what Casus is doing. He, and most, that's, that's a big challenge of these early arrivals in the US, like the Irish are exceptional in this regard because they, they always consider themselves wanting to go back. It starts with the Fenian movement, uh, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, some form of like new uprising, new kind of rebellion. And occasionally it works, occasionally it 
this a disastrous failure, but initially a lot of these European revolutionaries, regardless of where they were from, perceived that exile was going to be short term, that in two years they were going to be back in Europe and fight again. And, and that's why some of them stayed in Paris or London, because they were like, let's be close to the action. Hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Uh, how did the ideas of nationalism and, and liberalism come, come together in the immigrants' mind to formulate how they wish to proceed during the Civil War? Say, you know, uh, forming up a regiment of their own or just enlisting or or whomever it may be. Because in my mind, we, we hear of Thomas Marr all the time. We hear Patrick Claiborne all the time. We hear of other immigrants as well. And it always fascinated me how you had someone like Marr with his beliefs, and then you had Claiborne with his, and they're opposing each other. And you see this again with Hungarians and, and others as well. Uh, can you go into the uh, ideas of those liberalism and, and, and nationalism and how that combines into? And, you know, what you're, you're, you're going at there is exactly the really weird paradox that I, I, I'm... I struggled with in the writing of the book and, and to some extent still struggle with because nobody ever gives you like a nice, neat diary page where they outline it. <laughs> like, right. wouldn't it be nice? Like there's one yeah. page where it's like literally written down of like, this is why I'm doing it. And no, they don't do that for you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> then the other problem that you just have is that we just we have people on both sides. Um, yes, the predominant number of Germans, Hungarians, and Poles end up on the northern side, but there are some in the south in the same fashion that the Irish community is fairly divided. Mm -hmm. And that was a struggle, and that sort of goes to the heart of the argument of the book, that why would you do that? And that's why the baggage that they bring from Europe matters so much. It from what I was seeing, mattered how they perceived of oppression. If they perceived of oppression in the United States to originate with a Southern planter aristocracy that was gonna enslave the country, not in a chattel slavery sense, but by taking all the political power into their own hands, in that moment, they likely ended up with the northern side. Um, so that's what you get with, for example, the Germans. What do you get with um, some of the Hungarians? They're not looking at slavery. That's sort of the big paradox with the title of the book. I'm not talking about slavery as chattel slavery. A lot of these individuals, they didn't care about slavery. And that does not mean that they didn't care about what happens to African-Americans. It doesn't mean that the war wasn't about slavery. It just means in their mind, in that moment, mm -hmm. the enslavement politically, economically, or nationally of the country by a Southern aristocracy outweighed all other considerations. Now, if you get on the Southern side, and yeah, immigrants supporting the Southern side, they're likely looking at the North in an imperial fashion, i.e. Britain, Austria, Russia, trying to enslave the rest of the country. Hmm. That this imperial vision that the northern states have of an abolition, free labor ideology is going to enslave the rest of the country, is going to destroy the ways of life, just like what the British are doing in Ireland or what the Austrians are doing in Hungary, and therefore to, to engage in national self-determination, the southern states are right and we have to fight for so some people literally, they looked at their what happened in Europe and they're saying, well, the South is doing exactly what we're doing. Um, Kaspar Tachman, a Polish migrant, made that case and said, I'm fighting with the South because the South is doing what I did in Poland. Mm -hmm. And then you get individuals like Alexander Aspas. Mayor is a little different because he looks at the illegitimacy of the Southern decision to secede more and they're just saying, no, the South is trying to illegitimately claim power here. They're, they're a minority that is trying to force its way on the majority, very much like the aristocracy in Europe did. Hmm. Um, 
And then you get these odd outliers to like, I think it's Sahin, something like that. He's a pole in Louisiana. And he literally translated, well, going back to an earlier question, I and my family owned a manor in Europe. We had serfs. Well, I'm going to now own a plantation, plant sugar, and have slaves in Louisiana because I'm aristocrat. Mm -hmm. Right. It's the, the dream of moving up the ladder, yeah. so to yeah. speak. Yeah. You know, the, opp the opportunity to at least get there. Yeah. Be, be yeah. part of the establishment. Be part of the, the insider. Right. Like, the elites and, yeah. and such. Yeah. And it's, it's fascinating how not only is that seen from the immigrant point of view, as you, as you have so pointed out, it's, it's seen from those Western Virginians descended from the 1830s. Yeah. You say, There's the elite class and vice versa yeah. uh, seen by the, uh, the, the elite class in Virginia towards people from New York city. <laughs> yeah. And it does undercut a little bit too this kind of notion that this is this is simply a war about union. It's not necessarily all only about union here. It's about which side has political say in the country. It's not about all anti-slavery, especially for like some of these immigrant groups. So it's mm -hmm. it's a it's a much more complex and difficult environment that these immigrants have. I mean, look at Clayburn. Um, I think in large part, why does he support a Whig candidate initially in, Ar in Helena, Arkansas? And my friend David Chisler is going to enjoy this when he finally listens to it later in the weekend. I think it's because simply Whig and Whig, there was a Whig party in, it, in Ireland. He was a Protestant out of a Protestant family. So he looks at a Whig party in Arkansas and says, well, they're probably very similar. So I'm going to initially support them. And then kind of start to figure out, well, maybe I, if I want to fit in, I should maybe be owning some slaves. And <clears throat> we always hear about that long declaration he made there in the Chattanooga area in 64, early 64, after the defeat of the rebel forces, and where he suggests freeing the slaves. This is not about freeing slaves. I mean, it's often used by lost causes as like, oh, this is the moment where we see that the South actually wants to free slaves and it's not about slavery. It's like, no, it's, it's about slavery. Mayor, uh, sorry, Claiborne just understands that the South is losing. And the only way to maintain its independence and freedom, and he talks about subjugation to the Union, is to free the slaves and arm them because the South needs the manpower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a yeah it's it's such an amazing uh way of looking at it because as i said earlier we don't really connect these separatist movements to the secession movement yeah and and we we tend to think of it as in a vacuum and then you have everyone who's come from these separatist movements overseas and put their life on the line for whichever side they choose for the reasons that they did in Hungary or yeah. Poland or Ireland. And, and, and it's almost like uh, too many times, some of us disconnect previous life experiences from what they were, what they went through to yeah. the civil war. And it's like, well, well, that impacted them more than we really realize. Well, and I think the other problems that you see is scholarships that <clears throat> it, it, Someone blew my mind that when I kind of was like, oh, there was this one book that dealt with secessionism. I was like, oh, this is going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. And like, there's Texas, there is the United States, and everything else was 20th century. And I kind of was like, mm -hmm. but, but, but what about the other movements? We always categorize them as nationalist movements, but they are separatists because they're trying to break their nationality away from somebody else. So that's, I think, something we need to kind of gain a better understanding, both as scholars and just as a general national community, that the South is doing what a lot of people during the 19th century have done and importantly have failed at. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, the biggest aspect that we always have to consider is that when, when, when the 
Southerners talk about, oh, let's mimic Hungary or let's mimic Ireland. They're also talking about mimicking a failed cause, a failed revolution. So should we be surprised that the South fails? Probably not, because the South is doing something that just is not acceptable in the 19th century, and that is further complicating the international state system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it puts Britain in a tight spot, and, and France and everyone, I mean... Britain has been abolished later in what 1833, and they're kind of they would love to see the union be torn asunder, but for different reasons. Yeah, that's why I disagree with those scholars that I'm like, no. oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but uh, that's probably another podcast that we could do. Oh, we can do that. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think the biggest issues that we have to consider is there is that, and it makes that in other articles as arguments, and hopefully, well, sometime later in the summer, I get back to the books that. Yeah. When it comes down to it, when Britain looks at the world in 1860, 61, 62, 63, and 64, mm -hmm. and 65, what is happening in North America is regrettable. Mm -hmm. It is not economically shattering because, yes, we hear all about the cotton famines, the layoffs in the British factories. The British economy adjusts fairly well. Um, there are some changes happening, but in the great scheme of things, they'll master for a few years. Why get involved? From the British perspective, the U.S. doesn't even know what they're fighting over. <laughs> <laughs> but then the British government looks at, what's Napoleon III up to? Mm. Oh, he got his finger in Mexico. He got his fingers in Italy. He got his fingers in Lebanon, Syria. He got his fingers in Asia involved and stuff. Mm. They look at Russia. I think somebody raised the Crimean War in the question, so let's maybe head in that direction a little bit. Yeah. Um, Russia is a big evil for Pal the Palmerston government. Palmerston went to war in the Crimea because he wants to contain, using 20th century terminology, mm -hmm. Russia. Russia is active again. Poland is suffering from a rebellion in 61 and 63. There's a ch change in the Greek throne in 62. As I made it in a different piece that I'm saying, when it comes down to it, looking east or west for the British, Britain will always look east first because Russia is the bigger threat for the British than the United States will ever be. They can live with the United States playing its game in North America or potentially having an influence in South America. But when it comes down to it, Britain cannot accept Russia taking a stronger role in Europe. It just, it would challenge them. And that's where they need to pay attention. They can't devote resources in North America in a war that, why would you want to fight it anyways? Mm -hmm. Why do you want to fight the War of 1812? Right. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. I think it's in part the bully picture that we like to create, that mm. the British need to be our bully because we need to look better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. What would you say to anyone watching or anyone in the future watching about uh, looking to these international issues to try to contemplate the totality of the human experience in the Civil War and as far as immigrants or as far as separatist movements or whatever that may be? How should they look at these movements in the antebellum period as influencing the future of it? Well, in part of things, that's just the, the human causation of things. Um, we, we can't... and. I know you had Megan Kate Nelson on here a few days ago, and I think she has a very good point to raise that we like to study the Civil War as this kind of isolated four-year event, and we need to stop doing it. Mm -hmm. As she says, the West goes on. Yes, there's fighting in North America, but Native Americans are still pursuing their agenda. Hispanic people in the Southwest are pursuing their agendas. The world keeps going. And there is this larger frame that we have to be aware of, that there's causations that have been built for decades, immigrant groups that have come to the United States for generations that are all leaving in some form their footprint. I think when you really think about it, what a quarter of the U.S. military is immigrant or first generation during mm -hmm. the Civil War. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of people that... 
right. are fighting here, not because they're part of the country in some cases yet. Mm -hmm. So why do they do it? What do they perceive of this? Um, so that's, I think, where we really have to, especially we're living in a globalized world. So did the people then. So in a globalized world, there's a lot of factors we have to consider and long-term causations we have to consider. Now, at the same time, there are individuals who simply come to the United States because it's the next war. And we have to consider here too that the mid 19th century is one of the most volatile periods. I know you going into World War One are not gonna be happy to hear this. <laughs> we like to say, oh, you know, besides the Crimean War, nothing really happens between Napoleon and Sarajevo. Yeah, yeah. But it's not the case. That's right, that's right. We have a massive amount of wars happening. So right. there is this factor that there are people literally going from war to war mm -hmm. between 18, about 45 and 1880, and they're making a career out of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are these mercenaries. There are very few in this civil war, but they are there. And I think that's the other part we have to consider is that it's not just the immigrant experience. It is the military experience too that is a global phenomenon. This is not, I know we'd like to say it, it's not the first modern war. That goes to the Crimean War. Mm -hmm. The first experiences was trench warfare, was wartime correspondence. That's all Crimean War. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a daily war, yeah. What newest, some of the newer estimates, a million people almost die in the Civil War. Yeah, that's a lot. 2%, maybe 2.5% of the country's population. You look at Paraguay a few years later, they have 30% of the adult male population perish. And we're talking muscle loading and machetes. Right. We're not talking like machine guns like in World War II, World War I. That's right. Um, so look at China. Taiping Rebellion is the sixth most deadly war in human history. Mm -hmm. Up to 20 million people died. So in part, Yes, it's a deadly moment. It's a terrible war. But in the great scheme of things, it is one of many extremely bloody wars. And cynically speaking, it's phenomenal what people were able to do with muscle loading weapons. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And you'll be happy to know, Niels, tomorrow on the uh, live stream tour when we do Pick His Charge, I'm going to bring up Solferino. Um, uh, so. And we're, we're talking about Pegasus Charge and tactics, and I have to be the wild card, so I'm going to connect it with previous events, and we're going to talk about Napoleon III's men at Solferino. So that will really throw some people a curve. <laughs> yeah, that's sort of the other moment. I guess I should reach out to the National Civil War Museum, uh, National Civil War Medicine Museum, okay. there, because the Civil War era is the birthplace of the Red Cross mm -hmm. at Solferino. <laughs> And mm -hmm. in the Danish-German War of 64, it's the first time we actually see the use of the Red Cross on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of like, I, I've i thought about it. Maybe you can say something on that. Technically mm -hmm. speaking, during the American Civil War and in the movies, we should never see a orderly with a Red Cross because technically speaking, it is not yet the way we would distinguish somebody who's working as a medic on the battlefield yet. Right. right. Yeah. I'll tell Jake when <laughs> to get on that at the medical museum and he can, he can hook us up with that. That'd be good. There we go. <laughs> but uh, as I said earlier, I, I posted the link to the book is in the, uh, in the description. Thank you. For, for Niels. Oh, I was covering up his name there. Um, I have pinned it in there from LSU. Please, please grab a copy of that. And uh, Niels, this is a fantastic book. And since I'm a transnational historian, this is right in my wheelhouse. I love it. And, uh, and it's, it's fantastic. And I was really glad to be able to get that from you and, and read through it. And I'm, I'm so glad that you had time to come on and, and speak with me and everyone who follows the page this evening. It's been fantastic, my friend. 
Well, thank you for having me. And uh, we got to give a shout out before we go, Niels, to uh, to Eight Civil War. We got to get people on there, and we need to get people signed up. I should have posted that too in the comments. Maybe I'll go back in and share a link. There we go. That we can, we can Eight do that. Civil War, and we can get some people, new people, signed signed up for that. But again, thank you, Neil, so much. It's been awesome. No problems. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you all for watching on Facebook or YouTube. Really appreciate all of you reaching out, asking questions, comments. It's great stuff. We'll be able to go back through those. And I'll provide a link to H Civil War as well for all of you so you can sign up for that good stuff online. So take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.